The most encouraging development from Red Spring Training has emerged, and it is Hunter Green becoming a complete pitcher. We'll tell you why on today's Locked on Reds. You are Locked on Reds, your daily Cincinnati Reds podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. You are Locked On Reds with myself, Jeff Carr, and my co-host, Stephen Offenbaker. We are a lifelong Cincinnati Reds fans that have turned an addiction into information for you. We want to thank you for taking time out of your day to listen to us talk some Reds with you. We encourage you, if this is your first time, make sure that you subscribe on your favorite podcast app, or if you're watching us here on YouTube, hi, thanks, and hit subscribe and click the bell to get notified whenever we have more content for you, because we're going to be with you all throughout spring training, all throughout the season, all the way to October, which the Reds are heading for. You better write that down, because... Lockdown Reds is part of the Lockdown Podcast Network. We are your team every single day. And on today's episode, there is some great developments coming out of Goodyear as Hunter Green is becoming a more complete pitcher. We will explain why coming up here in just a moment. We're also going to look at the 26th man debate. There's a couple of guys that it feels like are in this conversation. Are we overlooking Stuart Fairchild in that? And are we even asking the right question? when it comes to the Reds 26th man. And then later on in today's episode, Levi Stout has some problems with Derek Johnson. He's the first. Uh, We'll we'll, we'll explain why I don't think he's necessarily correct. That's all coming up on today's Lockdown Reds podcast. This is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Check out the new user offer today. With any winning $5 bet for new users, you get $150 in bonus bets back. Just go to FanDuel.com slash locked on and where we are going to start today steve is the development out of good year that hunter green is adding to his repertoire he is adding a curveball he's working on a curveball and he's working on a splitter this is amazing news for many different reasons because it feels like hunter green is stuck in this rut where he's all or nothing he's either going to strike you out or you're going to get a hit off of him and he's got to stop doing Well, and the big problem, Jeff, has been we've been waiting for this changeup to materialize, right? We've been waiting for him to put together that pitch that can be used to keep guys off balance, to keep the hitters honest, so to speak, so that they can't just sit and wait on that fastball. And the problem has been that 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 changeup really hasn't come along. So Hunter is going to have to do something in order to create that uh, ability to keep the hitters off balance. This does that. Working on the curveball, working on the splitter is going to keep the hitters guessing. And I think a lot of what happened to Hunter Green last year is guys were able to just sit back and wait for that fastball to come. And when that fastball would finally come, they'd be able to get around on it. Because look, these are professional hitters, best hitters in the world. Uh, I don't care how hard you throw the ball. Eventually, if you give them enough opportunity to time you up they are going to and they are going to hit you so this is a big development for hunter green look we've been waiting for him to do something to take himself from that that oh i guess someday he could be an ace i guess someday he could lead this rotation we've been waiting for him to do a thing to take that from could to is and i think this could be the thing adding these two pitches becoming a well-rounded pitcher versus just a hard thrower is going to be the thing that makes him earn that spot that the Reds have really already given him, which is ace, number one, front of the rotation, opening day guy, all of the things, right? This is this is Hunter's right. opportunity now to embrace that and move forward with it. Yeah, because right now you're talking about Hunter Green as the opening day starter for ceremonial purposes, because he was the first extended player, because he was such a high draft pick, because there's a lot of pomp and circumstance surrounding that game. The conversation about who should start game one of the playoffs is totally different. He is trying to make that the same. He is trying to make it so that he absolutely is the ace of this team. And it's important that he's adding these pitches. And it's also important to note when we're saying that he's adding a curveball, it's not like he's going to be throwing a curveball as good as Nick Lodolo at the gate. When we say he's throwing a splitter, he's not going to be throwing Fernando Cruz's splitter. He's going to be throwing Hunter Green's splitter. So they're likely to be a little bit more closer to average than those guys. Let's let's face it. I mean, Fernando Cruz last year, if you look at baseball savant, was top five in the major leagues for how good his splitter 
was, how how much he was able to limit other hitters and how much he was able to make them swing and miss. What Hunter Green is seeking to do by adding these two pitches is twofold. The first one is that he is trying to miss barrels. We talked about this before with Hunter Green. He's very good at missing bats, but when he doesn't miss bats, they're getting barreled up and absolutely clobbered. He apps, he's actually one of the worst when it comes to allowing hard contact last year, especially with his bread and butter, which was his fastball. His fastball got clobbered last season. Opposing hitters had a slugging percentage over 500 against his fastball. Like you cannot do that and be even a viable major league starter, let alone an ace. So he's got to figure out some ways to buoy that a curveball and a sl- and a splitter are going to do two things. They're going to add um, the kind of break that he doesn't currently have in his arsenal right now. And it's going to change speeds. I mean, even with his slider, his slider averages around 88 miles an hour. His fastball averages around 97, 98 miles an hour. That's still a pretty close-ish. I mean, that's easy for me to say sitting here and not standing in a batter's box. But it's it's still close-ish on the miles per hour. Like, if you can add a slow curve or a splitter that's closer to 80, maybe even in the 70s, now you're really talking about messing with the hitters. Yeah, because I think that the, you know, the slugging percentage just illustrated what I was talking about there a minute ago, Jeff, where you give these major league hitters timing, you let them sit back and, and get your timing down, you're in trouble. And, and Hunter's done that. He's let the opposing team time him up. Uh, the biggest benefit of adding a curveball, if he can develop a pitch that's in the, the mid 80s that breaks 12 to 6, that would be that would be the game changer that he has not had in his his arsenal. And the same with a splitter. You know, you go back into the old days and watch some video of uh, some of these split finger guys that just completely make hitters look foolish. Uh, those are the potentials that Hunter Green has, and I think that he has the ability to to learn these and incorporate them. You know, and I know a lot of people are probably asking, well, if that's what it was going to take to make him spectacular, why hasn't he done it already? Why hasn't he learned these pitches already? As a and the simple to. fact is the matter is he hasn't had to. Exactly. <laughs> Coming up through the minor leagues, you know, and going all the way back into high school, I'm sure that Hunter Green was the best guy in the room in high school. He was the best guy in the room on his college. He was the best guy. Or he'd go to college, but you know, like I mean, he was the best guy in the yeah. room. <laughs> he was the best guy in the room at every level that he's played all the way up through triple a and he gets to the majors and suddenly he is no longer the best guy in the room uh there is a room full of the best guys in the room so this is now you know good to see him acknowledging that he needs to do more and i think that i think that that change in mindset is also uh part of his development as a pitcher uh knowing that he needs to do something to evolve and and i'm excited to see him do that the the vertical break that you hit on with the curveball and with the splitter is such a huge part of this. This is kind of like the second point as to why I'm so excited about him adding these two pitches is because in a singular pitch, those pitches are able to change a hitter's eye level. Right now, if you look at his heat map on Baseball Savant or something like that, when he throws his fastball, it's up in the zone. When he throws a slider, it's down in the zone. That's where you should be throwing those pitches, but... If I'm an opposing hitter, I step into the box and I say, if it's high, it's a fastball. And if it's low, it's a slider. That's what I know. And I know that I don't really have to worry about any other pitch. So he needs that thing that dives off the plate, that falls off the table, that at least dives down underneath your bat so that if you're swinging at this plane, all of a sudden the ball's down here and you've got to factor that in because when he adds something like that, it's just going to elevate his fastball and his slider even more. This is something that he has needed for a long time. And I'm glad that he is finally adding this because like we mentioned about the changeup, it's just not coming along last season. He threw it 5% of the time. The season before that he threw it 5% of the time. He has not gained any confidence with that pitch. And to be honest with you, the statistics actually back that up. It gets clobbered hitters are hitting over 300 whenever he throws his change up the few times that he does. So he's got to develop something. He's got to figure something out. The fact that he recognizes this and that he is trying to adapt his major league career to what is the, the, what the opposition is dictating to him. And he's adding these two pitches. Like 
even if they're just league average pitches, that's going to make his number one and number two so much better. Oh, absolutely. You know, one of the things with the with this development, Jeff, is you look at that change up, right? And 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 great statistics on only him throwing at five percent of the time. Uh, that's not enough time to really develop a pitch at, at the major league level. That's not enough to be able to say that you truly can throw that pitch. And and the few times he did throw it, it, it really didn't, it really didn't get over. It really didn't do any of the things that he needed it to do and that the so Reds needed for him to be yeah. able to do with it. Okay. It was, it was a throwaway. So, so what we know with Hunter Green is that adding the curve and adding the splitter are going to make him a well-rounded pitcher. They're going to make him a force at the top of this rotation. It will help him to stop being an all-or-nothing, here-comes-the-fastball kind of guy. All right, Jeff, coming up, are we sleeping on Stuart Fairchild? We've been accused of it in the comment section and on Discord. Uh, are we approaching this 26th man debate all wrong? Well, that could be the case. We're going to talk about that coming up here in just a minute. Before I get into any of that, I want to shout out the sponsor of today's podcast. Today's show is brought to you in part by FanDuel. Get buckets on your first bet with FanDuel, America's number one sports book, because right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets back with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 bucks back if your $5 bet wins. You can bet on all of your favorite NBA action and teams. They've got quick bets. They've got live same game parlays. They've got exclusive props and so much more. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and shoot your shot today. FanDuel now has some baseball odds. Uh, they have updated the over-under, folks. That's right. The Reds win total over-under for 2024 has fallen to 81.5. That is absolutely ridiculous. That is down from 82.5. They've shaved off a full game. So uh, in best Jeff Carr fashion, everyone say it with me. Take the over. over. 81 and a half. I'm going to take the over. Take the over. You should be taking the over here. That is ridiculous. Uh, get over to FanDuel right now and, and get started with your ability to win $150 back in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's at FanDuel the official sportsbook partner of the NBA and the official sportsbook of Locked On. Locked On has launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube. Locked On Sports Today is here for you 24-7, covering the top sports stories of the day with local experts like Jeff, Jeff and I from the Locked On Network, plus our national shows that cover every league. Just go to Locked On Sports Today on YouTube and subscribe to the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel. All right, Jeff, coming up on our next episode, uh, Graham Ashcraft could be the quiet ace of this staff right now, if, if not about to be surpassed by Hunter Green with these added pitches. But does that mean that Graham Ashcraft should be one of the next guys to get locked up with a long-term extension? Well, we're going to dig into that coming up on the next show. But there's a lot left on this show. Uh, we've been having some conversations about the 26-man, Jeff. And a lot of those conversations have centered around Jose Barrero. And Jose Barrero is going to be the 26th man on the bench. And Jose Barrero will be the emergency center fielder. And he will be the emergency infielder. And he'll be just the emergency, really. If he's playing a lot, it's an emergency. Uh, but we've been talking about it coming from that perspective. But over in the comment sections, both on the YouTube feed and in the Discord feed, a lot of people have been asking about Stuart Fairchild. And we really haven't spent a lot of time talking about Stu. Now, I understand uh, if you take all of his playing time and, and clump it all together, he's been good for a little over one war during his time in the major leagues. He's played a decent center field, and there's been times where he's been streaky good. Here's the problem. You can't count on that. I continue to maintain that Stuart Fairchild is simply a really good 4A player. He's not a full-time major leaguer. He's not even really a full-time on-your-bench kind of major league dude. He is a great insurance policy. But the problem is that the Reds have used him that way. I think they've used him effectively. They've gotten a lot out of him. But now he's out of options. So he can no longer be your minor league insurance policy. He can no longer be stashed down there at AAA unless he can clear waivers back and forth every time and then accepts the assignment. So the, the real fact here, Jeff, is that Stuart Fairchild's time is running out and it creates a scenario now when you look at that 26 men on the Reds bench, you have two guys in the same situation with both Jose Barrero and Stuart Fairchild being out of options. 
one of those two guys can play multiple positions for you on the infield and the outfield. The other one is that really that right-handed bat that is missing in the outfield if TJ Friedel needs a day off against a left-handed pitcher. That leads to this question. Maybe we are looking at it all wrong, and the 26th man on the Reds roster is currently on somebody else's roster for spring training, and Nick Crawl needs to be combing those waiver wires, digging through the mess, and looking for that guy that is working for somebody else right now but could be a great opportunity to pick up towards the end of spring training. That's kind of where I'm at with it because uh, let, let's, let's take it this way. There are four guys, really, that are vying for the 26th man on this team. It's Jose Barrero, Josh Harrison, Stuart Fairchild, and Nick Martini. Now, one of those guys we eliminate already for the simple fact that he's left-handed. I mean, Nick Martini did some nice things for this team last year, but I think that the most value he'll bring to the Reds is if he is a triple-A guy that they can call up in an emergency situation. It won't make a whole lot of sense to have a lefty on the bench to be a platoon partner for the other lefties that are in the lineup because you need a righty. But that also feels like the only reason that we're picking any of the other three guys is because they're right-handed. Like all of them have huge question marks. I love Josh Harris and I love the fact that he's a local guy, but he's kind of gotten to the point in his career where you have to squint a little bit to see the value. Jose Barrero has all the potential in the world and has shown it on multiple occasions in AAA, in the winter leagues, other places besides Great American Ballpark. He still has yet to show it at the major league level, and there are serious questions as to if he ever will. And Stuart Fairchild, for me, is a – if you are arguing adamantly for Stuart Fairchild to be the 26th man on this roster, then you are a prisoner of small sample sizes because you're looking at 2022. You're not even looking at 2023. You're looking at 2022 when in 38 games for the Reds, he had a 523 slugging percentage. And you're saying, boy, that's a great slugging. Oh, my goodness, he's slugging over 500. 38 games, less than 100 at-bats. We're not even talking about the number that's going to get you qualified for any sort of award. We're not even talking about any sort of number that's going to get you on anybody's list for any reason whatsoever. You would have to like go down and be like, well, for, for every hitter that's had X amount of at-bats and this is where he is, and it's like, no. You're trying too hard at that point to explain why he deserves this roster spot. And I think when I look at all four of these guys, and I get it, you are selling on the future of Jose Barrera because you would have to put him on waivers, and he's most likely going to get claimed by somebody that will have the ability to give him playing time. Doesn't bother me at all. Go find Mr. Outside Hire for this spot. I don't like any of these options. Let's talk about Josh Harrison for just a minute. We haven't spent a whole lot of time talking about him since he got signed either. Uh, he can play corner outfield. He can play on the infield. That does give him a little bit more flexibility. I believe that he still does have a little bit of baseball left in the tank. But I think we're talking about one year. We're talking about one year of Josh Harrison. And if, if and he can't all play things being field. equal, he yeah, he just can't do it. So it becomes a question of one year of Josh Harrison or potentially multiple years of one of those two other guys I think in the, it'd be in the Reds' best interest to keep one of those two other guys. But at the end of the day, uh, I hope that Harrison's able to play his way onto somebody else's roster as well because uh, I do believe he's got a little baseball left in the tank. But I, I'm with you. Mr. Outside Hire is the way to go. I saw, and again, this is criminally like focused in on the smallest bit of information, but I, I saw a headline in the Inquirer the other day from a certain Reds beat writer who will remain nameless who said that even though Josh Harrison has more all-star game appearances than anyone else on the roster, he looks like he's not going to make it. Really? Really? That, no. That's not what we're talking about here. Like, I get it as of this moment, but there's going to be a lot more all-stars on this roster, even after just this year, not even just the next couple of years. Like, Look, I admire everything that Josh Harrison has done, and he is a Reds killer. He goes on the list of killers of the Reds in his career because of what he did with Pittsburgh and how many different times he he was able to drop in a clutch hit or make a nice play in the field or something. But 
he just doesn't fit. Like when, whenever we added him as a minor league signing with an invite to spring training, I kind of did a look. I'm like, okay, could it be him or Jose Barrero? And the more that I look at both of them, I'm just like, does it have to be him or Jose Barrero? Can it be Mr. S? Can they go get Michael A. Taylor off the free agents list right now? Can they go get Adam Duvall off the free agents list right now? Can they go get waiver claim right-handed outfield guy that's most likely better than all these guys yes they can so please go do that congratulations that's the first time all offseason you haven't said michael a tucker good job it took the entire offseason <laughs> you finally, finally got, got the name it. right good finally job oh, michael finally tucker. got it that's great no look i'm that's i'm with you head. jeff i i just i feel like oh, all things being equal if you're gonna keep one of those guys you don't keep the 36 year old that's going to only give you one year and be done. You, you keep one of the guys that you can continue to develop. But at the end of the day, I think there's going to be a lot of potential out there that's available that you can bring in that might give you a couple years, might give you multiple years, but that will play better. Because even as the 26th man, whoever's down there is the last guy on the roster. The way that David Bell fiddles and tinkers in game, that dude is going to play. He's going to see playing time. And it needs to be somebody that there's not a tremendous fall off. There's going to be fall off. Otherwise he would be the starter, but you need a guy that you can put in there and be confident that is going to at least play you decent defensively and can come up with the occasional hit. And I don't know that any of these guys are, are, are really that guy right now. And maybe it's the guy that they've claimed off waivers twice so far this year, Bubba Thompson, maybe Bubba Thompson is the 26th man, which leads us to our next point. Levi Stout is unhappy. The Reds waived Levi Stout so that they could claim Bubba Thompson. And Levi Stout had some, he had some problems with Derek Johnson and the Reds pitching development. And coming up, we're going to look at why the evidence, eh, it's against him. Before we do that, though, I want to tell you about another one of today's sponsors, and that is eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience is what brings home the winning trophy and it also keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance from superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices that you want, it's easy to turn to your car into the MVP and bring home that win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions do apply. eBay guaranteed fit only available to U.S. customers. You know, in between shows, you can follow us on Twitter, on X. You can follow me at Jeff Carr with three Fs. You can follow Steve at S. Offenbaker with two Fs. And you can follow the show at Lockdown Reds. There's no Fs in that. Also, make sure you join the Lockdown Reds Discord page. A lot of great folks talking Reds baseball over there, mentioning, mentioning Twitter and uh, Discord as well. It reminds me, I put out a poll to see what people thought about the 26th man. Stuart Fairchild won that poll. So again, more to the point, everybody is a prisoner of small sample size. And for the written word, go to insidethereds.com. We are covering the Reds in written word over there. Bookmark that website today. All right, Steve. Levi Stout had some, uh, some things to say because he was waived by the Reds and picked up by the team that traded him to the Reds. Um, I don't necessarily like, I mean, I, I, I get it. You know, you're, you're leaving a team and you're like, well, let's compare my new team to this team. So here's what he had to say before we, before we tear it down. Uh, this, this was his quote about the Reds pitching development staff. He said, quote, it was different. It was a little bit of, I'd say, lack of direction in my sense. It was kind of not much of a philosophy. It was kind of just go play baseball and we'll help you along the way. Steve, your thoughts. First off, shots fired at Derek Johnson. That's a, that is a direct attack on direction. Derek Johnson because the Reds put Derek Johnson not only in charge of the Reds' big league team as far as pitching goes. You will recall when his contract was up, they made him the pitching guru of the organization. And Derek Johnson sets the philosophy from top to bottom, from Cincinnati to Daytona. 
Derek Johnson is in charge of how pitchers are going to be developed. So the things that Levi Stout had to say, that's a direct shot at Derek Johnson. You couple that with some things that I've been seeing in the comment sections and over on X and on the Discord, where people are starting to question the the guruness of Derek Johnson and wondering if it's not time to hold him accountable. And then you start seeing things like this. Uh, for me, I don't know that I necessarily believe that uh, what Levi has to say is the same as what the other pitchers in this organization have to say, because we've talked to pitchers. We've talked to pitchers that, put, that pitch for this team at the big league level that have been pitching in the minor leagues. And I have never heard anyone say anything bad about Derek Johnson or the philosophies that he's tried to instill. And that's he's not only when we're recording, they're obviously not going to attack him while we're recording, but you know, these guys talk to us before and after and when we're around and nobody has ever said anything bad about Derek Johnson. My friends that are with the organization have never told me that pitchers are privately bashing Derek Johnson. So I don't buy this. I think Levi Stout came from a situation in Seattle in the Seattle organization where he was comfortable and he felt like they knew him and they put a lot of time and, and money into developing him. And then in their best interest traded him away to get one of the best pitchers in baseball right now. So I can understand why his feelings were hurt a little bit and why he felt like whatever situation he went into was not as good as where he came from. And now he's right. going back to that situation, to an organization that believes in him. Good for him. I hope he finds success. I hope that he finds his way. Listen, here's, the, here's what's the truth, Jeff. Not everybody will respond to the way that a system is run the same way. Not everybody will react to a way you're trying to develop pitchers with the right kind of results. Sometimes, and that's why we call them these kind of deals, change of scenery deals. A change of scenery has to happen. And in this case, Levi Stout's going back to some place where he was comfortable and he knows that they do things in a way that work for him. Uh, if Levi Stout knew the things that he needed to become a better pitcher and didn't ask the Reds for them, he never said, I asked the Reds for this thing and they didn't give it to me. Uh, it sounds to me like Levi Stout needed to be his own best advocate and speak up. And if he wasn't getting what he needed from the development program, he needed to say, this is what I need. And I'm sure that the Reds would have given him to him because in the end of the day, they wanted that trade to be successful for the Reds. They wanted him to be successful for the Reds. They wanted to have Levi Stout around to help push them towards the postseason. Uh, none of those things happened. So I think this is a bit of maybe a little sour grapes, maybe a little the grass was greener over there on the other side, and, and he wants to, to highlight that. But I do not believe that Derek Johnson is a problem. Uh, I do not believe that there is this silent majority in the red system that think this way about Derek Johnson either. Now the, the, the whole term silent majority is just triggering to me. Uh, but when it comes to this, I, I find it is a big nothing burger. Um, I think Levi Stout had a little bit of Tony Gardner in him. Uh, fans of the office will know what that is. He just didn't like the management style of Derek Johnson and that's fine. We are all human beings. We all have different things that make us comfortable. And if something makes us uncomfortable, there is literally nothing that can fix that. There is literally nothing that Derek Johnson could have done to fix Levi Stout. And while Derek Johnson would never admit that, these words, this quote from Levi Stout lets me know that. Because whenever Bubba Thompson was claimed off waivers for the second time this offseason and Levi Stout was waived, I was low key a little bit concerned because I'm like, why are the Reds giving up on this guy? Why are they, why are they just putting him out there for anybody to pick up? Someone's definitely going to pick him up. I feel like he could more have more value to the team. This quote lets me know he had no value to the Reds whatsoever, and they had no problem putting him on waivers because some people are just not receptive to what's going on. And here's what I say when I say I don't think the evidence supports what he is saying because there's a lot of folks that are just like, oh, maybe this is, maybe this is indicative. Graham Ashcraft, Andrew Abbott, Brandon Williamson, Alexis Diaz, the rest of the bullpen last year, Chase Petty even ongoing through the minor leagues, Julian Aguiar being the pitcher of the Reds, the, the best you know voted Reds farm system pitcher of the year. All these guys are developing. All these guys are improving. All these guys are showing how deep the Reds farm system is at the pitching level and how much the future is just so exciting on the mound for the Reds. I give zero points, no credit whatsoever to Levi Stout's quotes here. And I think that it's absolute garbage. And I think that he's wrong. 
because I think that the Reds pitching staff has never had as good a direction as it currently is right now. And you're right. Like we've talked to players that have direct contact with Derek Johnson. We've talked to some folks uh, that have contact within the organization that they talk to pitchers and they talk to Derek Johnson. There has never been a negative word said about his program. There's never been a negative word said about Derek Johnson. So the fact that there are some people that are taking this quote from Levi Stout and running with it, continuing to try and push this narrative that the Reds are not headed in the right direction is incorrect. So I absolutely agree with that, Jeff. I think that, uh, you know, people are going to, people like to create controversy and they like to seize on things like this and, and try to make it bigger than it is, especially in the absence of not having played any spring training games yet. Uh, people are still looking to fill column inches. They're still looking to fill the void. Uh, a lot of this is going to go away come next Saturday when actual games start playing. But in the meantime, I think all is well with the development of pitchers within this organization. I think Derek Johnson is doing a great job and I am ready to watch him uh, take this group of pitchers uh, and move them forward in 2024. Mark down the Locked On Reds podcast as Derek Johnson stands. And you know what, by the way, like I, I, I mean, no ill will toward Levi Stout in this quote. I really hope that Stout Stout gets picked up in Seattle and it works. And hey, I'll buy a can if it's like on sale at Jungle Gems or something like that. But, you know. <laughs> Whatever. Just didn't work out in Cincinnati for him. Sad that he had to take shots at Derek Johnson. That's how we're going to end today's podcast. Thanks, everybody, so much for checking out today's Lockdown Reds podcast. If you are not an everydayer, what are you doing? Become an everydayer right now by hitting that subscribe button and making sure that you click the bell on uh, YouTube to get notified whenever we've got new content for you. By the way, also click the like button. That helps out the algorithm, helps other people find the show as well. And comment. Comment anything. Literally, any old thing. Within reason, whatever, anything. It'll, within it'll help the within, within <laughs> reason, not any. Listen, Jeff, specific and, 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 instructions, and, my friend. Specific instructions. And shutting it down right now. If you comment about me shaving my beard, it ain't happening. You can do it, but it's going to be just lost in the ether. Anyway, coming up on the next Lockdown Reds podcast for our everydayers is Graham Ashcraft. The next guy to get an extension. There was actually an article from Charlie Goldsmith about that very thing, and we are going to discuss it on the next Locked on Reds. But until then, what can people expect from you and me, Steve? We're getting fully geared up because spring training games, they're coming this weekend. We're going to gather up all the news, all the information, all the rumors. We're going to be paying attention to what's going on with this roster and rosters around the league. We're going to gather up all that information and bring it back right here to keep you locked on Reds every single day. That coffee really hit in the third the segment. Beard. Shave the beard. Shave the beard. You're an